All right, thank you very much for filling in the time while we were getting organized on our technology here. Um, welcome to the Saskatchewan Science Centre. My name is Sandy Baumgartner and I'm the Executive Director here at the Science Centre. So I have the privilege of welcoming not just those of you that are here in the theatre with us this afternoon, and those that are here with us in the theatre this afternoon are grade five, six, and seven students from St. Andrews. Is that correct? Yes. Everyone say hi. Hi! Okay, now I'll explain to you who you're saying hi to. Maybe they couldn't see you, but hopefully they heard you. Through the wonders of technology, we've got a number of schools across the province that are joining us for this event. Um, through, the, through the wonderful technology of the internet. So we're webcasting this to schools in Regina. We've got a number of schools in Regina that have joined us. Welcome, schools in Regina. I'm not gonna list y'all. Schools in Saskatoon, thank you very much for joining us. As well, we have schools from Gull Lake, Shaunavon, Yellowgrass, Maple Creek, LaRange, and Bruno. Now, some of it might have been missed, but that's what I have on my list that had signed up to join us this afternoon. So thank you all for joining us through the internet. Hopefully you'll enjoy the presentation, and there is a mechanism for you to ask questions later on, so please be asking questions throughout. Similarly, the students here in the theater, you'll be able to ask questions of our, our special guests as we go through the afternoon presentation. Um, today we're here to officially launch, even though the, the information has been available and the contest has been open, the 25 Acts of Conservation. Now, this is a new pro, it's not a new program, it's a new program for the partnership of the Saskatchewan Science Centre and the Saskatchewan Environment Society. And we want to welcome Angie and Pam here today, and you'll meet them a little bit later on. So everyone say hi to Angie and Pam. Hi! hi. They, they're going to tell us a bit about some of the types of acts that you can do for conservation. We also have some of our sponsors with us today, and we couldn't do these types of programs without the generosity and the time commitment of our sponsors. So we've got Leslie here from Sask Energy, we've got Suzanne here from the Cooperators, and Sydney here from Sarcan. And you'll get a chance again to meet them, but first of all, say hello to them. Hi. 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 Just make sure that you're all still paying attention. So they're going to come later on and, and they're going to give you some encouragement to do your acts of conservation. But I'm sure that you're already doing some of those acts already. Um, our special guest today is Tiffany Lise from Global Television. Some of you might have seen her. If you live here in Regina, you'll see her on the news every night doing the weather. Sometimes we like her. Some days we don't. Some days we kind of curse her when it's cold out. Today it was kind of cold. You could have fixed that. But Tiffany's not here just to talk about the weather. Tiffany's actually here to, to probably dispel some myths for us about the difference between meteorology and, and climate science because they are quite different, but they are very much related. And, and certainly doing things through our 25 acts of conservation will help address some of the concerns that, that we have as a society because of climate change. So Tiffany's going to break that down for us today and then we'll hear a little bit more from the Saskatchewan Environmental Society about the contest that hopefully you'll all participate in. So again, thank you very much for joining us today and have a great day. After we're done the presentation, I know that the students from St. Andrew's School will get a chance to go and explore the Science Center a little bit more and probably Yay. test out some of your ideas for your 25 Acts of Conservation. So enjoy your afternoon. Thank you for coming. Tiffany? I needed a couple of Red Bulls just to match your energy. <laughs> Hi, my friends. Bonjour, mes amis. Thank you to those who are Hi. tuning in across Saskatchewan today. Very exciting. I'm going to be talking to you guys today, as was told, about climate, climate change in specific, and the weather. So I'm sure that many of you have learned about the weather in your classes. Yeah? Can a few of you, by lifting up your hands, tell me what your favorite thing about the weather is? In the purple, far in the back. When it's nice. When it's nice. Oh, I think you and everybody as well. How about you? When it's storming out. When it's storming. Very good. So, I'm going to tell you a little bit about how climate change can affect those storms because I think.
besides it being nice and sunny and warm, storms are one of the most interesting things about the weather. So I'll get a little bit into that as well. So as mentioned, my name is Tiffany Lee Say. I'm on Global Regina at 6 o'clock and 10 o'clock at night. Um, right now I'm actually studying meteorology through the University of Mississippi. I do all of my studies online and so in about a year and a half I'll be a meteorologist. As of right now, I am uh, a weather specialist. So we'll get right into it here. So I think first things first when we're talking about climate change and weather, we kind of need to take a few steps back and talk about the basics first. So. Let's talk about weather. Weather is quite simple. It's, it's all around us. Weather is happening, what's happening right now outside, and it changes daily. So it talks about uh, current weather, short-term weather, and long-term forecasts, which is what I do every night on Global Regina. It also tells you what it is like outside right now, or maybe what it will be like outside, whereas climate it's a little bit um, more detailed. Climate is the average weather conditions over a period of time. It adds all the temperatures together and uh, it could be over months, it could be over years, decades, centuries. It just accumulates all of this data. So the temperatures over the last year, when they put that all together, that is climate. So I have a few pictures just to kind of help you understand the difference. I'm sure many of you know the difference, but maybe this is easier to wrap your mind around. So this is an example of weather. This is what I show on Global Regina every night, Monday to Friday. So you can see the current temperatures. Last night, minus 12, and it was pretty windy yesterday, right? Yeah. So that's an example of weather. There's also this seven-day forecast. When it comes to climate, it takes all of that weather, as I mentioned, and it puts it all together. So we can get an average idea of what the temperature should be like, what the winds should be like outside. This one right here shows you the temperatures and the precipitation. So you can see the red line there. That's the average daily maximum temperature. The blue line on the bottom is the minimum temperature and the black one kind of averages the two. And the, the precipitation is the average precipitation we should see in that month, and this goes uh, for the 12 months of the year. Now this data was taken from 1981 to 2010. This is taken right from our Environment Canada website, and it gives you an idea. So if you take a look at March, the daily minimum temperature is minus 10. The daily maximum temperature is zero, and the average is minus five. So this gives you a clear idea of what uh, climate is like. Another example, something I said yesterday on the news. When we uh, put together all the temperatures in the month of January. Do you guys remember what January was like? Would you say it was cold or would you say it was warmer? Cold. cold. Winter is usually pretty cold, right? Well, actually, January was four degrees warmer than average. And that's when we put climate into effect when it comes to weather. So normally, temperatures in January were four degrees cooler than what we were actually seeing. Now February, what we just finished, the month we just finished, was actually five degrees colder than what it should have been for this time of year. Again, that's an example of climate. Another example of climate would be the seasons. So what is it usually like in the summertime? Warm. It's pretty hot. What about in the wintertime? Cold. Cold. Right. So that's a perfect example of climate and weather, kind of hand in hand. So summer is hot, spring is usually when temperatures are starting to warm up, um, winter is when it's cold, and fall is when those temp temperatures are starting to cool down. We know these things because of climate, because of all the studying over uh, centuries, we know what those temperatures should be like. So now we'll get into climate change and global warming. We should try and decipher the two for you guys because I'm sure you've heard both. So climate change is a change in the climate patterns. That includes temperature, precipitation, winds, etc. Now global warming is a little bit more specific. When people talk about global warming, they're talking about any change in the global average surface temperature. Now something I kind of want to, a myth that I want to squash 
right now, I shouldn't say myth, some uh, misconceptions. People will say, oh, well, you know what, January was four degrees warmer than normal, that's global warming. Not necessarily. When people talk about gl climate change and global warming, they're looking at data and climate data that is over centuries or over years. They're not just looking at uh, a month and saying, oh, that's global warming or that's climate change. Global warming is also known as global cooling because we're seeing temperatures cool there as well. So here's a few facts on climate change. We have rising in global temperatures, carbon dioxide increase, ocean acidification, and just a brief little summary on that is that that's an increase in carbon dioxide that warms the oceans and in turn uh, that can affect certain species that live in the oceans that maybe like the oceans to be a little bit cooler. And another fact on climate change is melting glaciers, which also uh, affects weather quite a bit. Another term that you should be familiar with when talking about climate change is the greenhouse effect. Now, have you guys ever seen a greenhouse before? Yeah. So it's essentially the same way that a greenhouse works, just the entire earth and the sun. So what happens is that sunlight passes through the atmosphere and it warms the earth. Then the infrared radiation is given off by the earth and most of it escapes out into outer space and that allows the earth to cool. But some of the infrared radiation is trapped by gases in the air, including carbon dioxide, and that keeps the earth warm enough to sustain life. So we don't want all of that infrared radiation to seep out into uh, space because then we'd be very cold. And we were cold enough today, I think, right? We don't want it to be any colder. But we also don't want that infrared radiation to be trapped too much more on Earth because then it would get a little bit hotter. And I know us in Regina, we like the warmer weather, but we don't want it too much hotter. So that is where we get to the enhanced greenhouse effect. So this is where that carbon dioxide could be bad. So increasing levels of carbon dioxide increases the amount of heat retained, causing the atmosphere's surface to heat up even more. And that's not what we want. We want temperatures to stay fairly similar to what they are right now. Of course, there's always fluctuation that you have to remember as well. So greenhouse effect means a warmer atmosphere. This also means warmer oceans. That in turn can mean stronger storms and rising sea level. We also have melting snow and ice, which again means rising sea level and the earth absorbs more energy. That can also mean changing conditions for plants and animals, which isn't good at all because that means habitat loss. And then some of those species that lost their habitat, they die off quicker. And then that can lead to, to extinction where they don't exist at all anymore. And that's not good. We like our animals and our plants, right? They do a lot for us. They clean the air. They act as food and that kind of thing. So we want to keep them here, I think. And also uh, changing conditions also means shifting migration and changing seasonal patterns. I think the one that affects the weather almost the most is more evaporation. That can mean more droughts, more wildfires, more precipitation at times, and stronger storms. To get a little more into it, a little bit more specific, climate change and weather, as I mentioned, it causes uh, the weather to be more extreme. The drought, the heavy rains in different areas, so some area that needs the rain, it needs more water for the plants, for the animals, they won't be getting it. And then other areas that don't want any more rain, they'll be getting more rain. And you know what more rain means? Flooding and that kind of thing. And that's not very good either. Climate change melts the ice sheets and snow on mountaintops, causing, uh, in turn, causing rising sea levels. So that can be bad news as well, especially for those that live along the coast, because that can shift the coastline. Shifting wind patterns. That means that'll push that warmer water and some of the warmer air northward, replacing the cooler water, say in the Arctic, where it's nice and cold. And that's not good because we have all of our fresh water in those glaciers and we want to keep them the way they are. We don't want to melt them faster than they're already melting naturally. That also means warmer oceans. Now something that you should understand is that oceans and ocean currents 
That's a big part of weather. That's what causes those high pressure systems, those low pressure systems. Do you guys know the difference between a high pressure system and a low pressure system? Yeah? High pressure system brings in that nice sunny air, sometimes colder air, but it keeps that, uh, the skies clear. Whereas a low pressure system pushes in that stormy weather, uh, whether, it's, uh, whether it's snow or if it's rain, that kind of thing, that cloudy air. So that, most of that is built up over the ocean and it makes its way across Canada into Saskatchewan. So the ocean is a big part of that. So if we get a warmer ocean, the ocean fuels things like hurricanes and it fuels the, the big low pressure systems that push over us. So warmer oceans means more fuel for these storms. And even though some people like the stormy weather, we don't want too much stormy weather, right? That's not very good either. We don't want too much snow or too much rain because that means flooding and that could cause issues as well. Another thing that I had mentioned was the higher temperatures that we've been seeing. Now I know we don't feel this much in Regina. It's pretty cold here. But if you look at the temperatures over a global scale, we're seeing higher temperatures. And that brings us back to this board right here. So that those red, uh, black, and blue lines are actually going to slowly get higher and higher. And here in Saskatchewan, we don't want it to get too much warmer because we actually depend on our snow and we depend on the weather that we get here because we've adapted. We have plants and certain species that live here for a reason because they like these temperatures and if it were to be warmer, they'd need to find somewhere else to go. And in turn, that could mean that some of those die off and like I mentioned, maybe even to the point of extinction. So we, we don't want these temperatures to increase. This is uh, something that came out recently. The global temperatures, when you look at the entire Earth, it's said by the uh, glaciologist Ricardo Yana that global temperatures have warmed up in the last 50 years. The global temperatures have warmed up by 3 degrees, and that's much, much faster than it should be warming up. So that's kind of cause for concern. That makes us look at why are these temperatures increasing so much. To bring it to maybe a more local scale, this is a great study that recently came out, um, some research done at the University of Regina. They found that there's an increase in carbon dioxide being absorbed in the lakes in southern Saskatchewan. And really, what that means when we're seeing an increase in carbon dioxide, it is being absorbed in the lakes, which isn't very good for any of the fish. Does anybody like to fish here? I love to fish. It is one of my favorite things to do. It's not very good for the fish if we're seeing more carbon dioxide, right? And we want those fish to stay alive because if we're going to go fishing, we need to be able to catch them and fry them up, right? But if there's more carbon dioxide, that can affect those fish. Another thing is that eventually that carbon dioxide is to be released back into the atmosphere. Now, this study has um, changed. It used to be a little bit different, and they were able to pin down that, in fact, the increase in carbon dioxide is being absorbed, especially here in southern Saskatchewan. And we do a lot of farming in southern Saskatchewan, just in the southern prairies. Do we have any farmers or people who have family who farms here? Yeah, probably a lot of people, especially those uh, outside of the city here that are watching us today. A lot of people are into farming. Farming is very, very important for Saskatchewan. But what that means, and I grew up in a farming community. I grew up in Gravelburg, Saskatchewan, if any of you have heard of it. And I grew up on a farm. So we did a lot of farming. Now, sometimes what farmers do is they have to spray a chemical in order to kill the weeds in the farm or in the crops, right? Because the weeds, they might kill whatever kind of grain or whatever you're growing in your field and they don't want that because that can hurt their bottom line. So they spray chemical. So how this affects the farmers, because there's an increase in carbon dioxide being absorbed, that means they need to start thinking more about what they're spraying in their field and what's being run off into our lakes and our rivers and any kind of body of water. So this uh, definitely is, affects us big. And the thing with climate change is, well, it's always changing. 
Right? There are always studies coming out and saying different things and expanding the knowledge. And so you have to stay up to date. So this is wonderful that this is coming from here in Saskatchewan at the University of Regina. And they found something to do with us here in southern Saskatchewan. Now I know I went through that a little bit quicker than I should have. I was a little bit nervous. You guys made me nervous because you're so quiet. Do you guys have any questions or maybe any weather questions that you can throw my way? You guys have been learning it in school, correct? Correct. Correct. Any questions to throw my way? Yes. Um, when did you first realize that you wanted to go into the weather part of your career? That's a good question. Well, I told you that um, I grew up in Gravelberg, Saskatchewan, and I'm a big farmer, or my family is very big into farming. And I think I realized that I wanted to go into weather at a young age because weather affects farming so much. So when we wake up in the morning, what the first thing my father would do is turn on the TV and well, we didn't have much internet out in Gravelberg when I was growing up, but he would check the weather. It's the first thing, so it's very important. So if it was going to rain that day, then we couldn't do certain things. If it was going to be sunny that day, that meant we were out rock picking or doing whatever we could for the farm, which is very important. I also have some pilots. My grandfather and my father are pilots, so that plays a big part in our family as well, and it just made me more and more interested. And in southern Saskatchewan, which, I'll, which actually comes back to climate change, we see a lot of severe weather. And I was very interested in tornadoes, in lightning and thunderstorms. I loved that and I wanted to learn more about it. Um, something that's very interesting, I'm happy you brought that up, is that people often say that southern Saskatchewan, we're seeing more tornadoes because of climate change. That's not necessarily true. But the reason why people find that there are more tornadoes is because of social media. You guys know what Facebook is and Twitter? Yeah, probably, hey? So with more of that, it's easier for people to talk about what they saw that day, meaning tornadoes or funnel clouds or whatever the case. You in the back? Well, it likely wouldn't be, um, sorry, she asked what would happen if we ate the fish that absorb all this carbon dioxide. Now, I'm sure Angie and Pam could correct me if I'm incorrect here, but unless it's a large amount of carbon dioxide, it's likely not going to affect us too much here. But I'll let uh, Angie and Pam maybe focus on that one a little bit more when they come up here. But great question. Yes? I joined Global Regina about two and a half years ago. Before that, I was in Edmonton and I was studying Earth and Atmospheric Sciences at the University of Alberta, and that's what I got into right after high school. And I studied that for about a year, and then I took some time off and I went into Radio and Television Arts. And then once I finished that program, I landed the position here in Regina. So I was able to come back to my home province, which was very wonderful. Any other questions? Oh, three in a row, four in a row. Yes? Um, are you ever nervous being on the news? Not anymore. I used to be nervous going on the news, um, but I'm more nervous talking to you guys right now <laughs> than I am going on TV because when I'm on TV, it's only me and a camera, and I'm okay with the camera. But I can't see everybody else, right? Nobody's staring at me like this. So it's a little bit easier. I'm more nervous going and standing in front of people who are looking right at me. Um, so yeah, I hope that answers your question. <laughs> yes? What's the worst weather you've seen? The worst weather I've seen, well, tornado. yes, tornado. So I'll tell you a quick little story. When I was in grade, oh, I believe it was grade 10 or 11, we went on a field trip and we came here to Regina. And when we were driving back, we got to Moose Jaw and we looked up and we saw those really funny popcorn clouds. They're called Mematis clouds, right? And that's the first time that I ever remember seeing clouds like that. And when we were driving, and I'd already been very interested in the weather, so I was glued to the window looking outside. And when we were driving home, um, 
all of a sudden you could look to the side and see the grass in the ditch, it just went flat. And you could really see how the weather was changing. It was very, very interesting. And sure enough, and you couldn't see anything because it was a, it was a rain wrapped tornado. And, uh, but we were getting phone calls because there was a confirmed tornado on the ground very close to us. And so our families were calling us, telling us to get off the road, of course. So luckily we were able to pull over in Maisonade. We had one of the girls with us, her grandma lived in Maisonade. So we were able to pull over and go into the house until the, the storm blew over. But that was scary. And I've seen lightning strike with a big fire. That was scary too. Does that answer your guys' question? And I just actually have a couple questions here from uh, Mr. Wagner's class in Saskatoon. Oh, hello, Mr. Wagner's class. <laughs> Jesse wants to know what the favorite part of your job is. Jesse, my favorite part of my job, <sighs> I think just telling people the weather every day probably sounds a little bit cheesy, right. but I absolutely love it. I love being back in Saskatchewan, and because weather was such a big part of our day growing up, um, I really take pride in being accurate with my forecasts and being able to tell people the weather. And I have, fair, I have a lot of fun with my co-anchors, uh, Whitney and Derek. We're, we're friends outside of work, so it makes it a lot more fun. And uh, just doing something that I love doing makes it a good time. Thank you. Uh, Aiden would also like to know from the same class, how has climate change had a negative effect in Saskatchewan? Wow, good question. Um, as I mentioned, from what I know, it would be those that increase in, in carbon dioxide in the lakes. That's the biggest effect that I can tell you, but as Angie and Pam come up, I'm sure that they will have more specific um, examples for you. Any other questions? Um, just another one from Mr. Ezra's class again in Saskatoon. How do we know what the temperature is supposed to be at? How do we know what the temperature is supposed to be at? Well, if I can go back here, a couple slides. Environment Canada has all of this data that um, some of it dates back into the 1800s. So they've combined a lot of this data and they tell us for which regions what it's supposed to be like for this time of year. So this one that I have on screen behind me, this shows for Regina, Saskatchewan. Now, if you look at some place like Maple Creek, they actually see a lot warmer temperatures. So they're going to see different uh, daily maximum temperatures and daily average temperatures. But this is something that Environment Canada uh, has their meteorologists compile all the data for us. Any more questions in the crowd? No? Yeah? No, I go into work usually around 2 o'clock. So I go in at 2 o'clock and I put something together that I call my web weather. So if you go online every day, I have something posted, um, usually around 4 o'clock. And then I put together my 7-day forecast and I build all of my own forecasts, all of my own boards. And I put them up at 6 o'clock. And then I go home and have some supper. And then I come back at about 8 o'clock. And I go back through everything because the weather in Saskatchewan, you guys know, the weather changes on a dime. So I go back and make sure that there aren't any changes that I maybe missed. And I build my forecast um, up again for 10 o'clock and everything's live. So if I make a mistake or if I, oh, the other day I started coughing accidentally, <laughs> that's all live. So if I make a mistake, honey, you are seeing it. So it's, uh, it's all live. Yes? It feels weird to point at green. Um, using a green screen is, is very difficult sometimes. I do have a screen, say the green screen is behind me, I have a screen right here and a screen right here. So I can look at those screens to see where I'm pointing. Um, but otherwise I'm just pointing into blank air, kind of like I'm doing right now. So because it's live, sometimes I point at uh, Swift Current and I mean to be pointing at a Cinnaboya and it looks a little bit crazy, but that's just because it's, sometimes it's tricky when you're pointing at nothing to kind of figure out. And sometimes if I put my arm back too far, I look like I have a little T-Rex arm on TV. And if I put it too far forward, I look like I have a go-go gadget arm. So it can be a little bit tricky. It plays with your mind a little bit. Yes? Have you ever accidentally worn green 
And then <laughs> uh, yes, I actually have worn, a, I have a dress that had a little bit of green in it and I just didn't even think about it and I did disappear. And sometimes even shiny things, I didn't completely disappear, just little parts. Um, I, had a, I had a shiny belt on and because it was shiny it reflected the green off the walls and so my belly disappeared. So I looked like I was cut in half. <laughs> Yes? Um, Meg from Mr. Wagner's class in Saskatoon wants to know how many years do you have to go to school to become a meteorologist? Good question. Um, in my case, I will be studying, uh, right now as I mentioned, I'm studying uh, broadcast meteorology through the University of Mississippi through correspondence. That's a three-year course. Originally, I was studying Earth and Atmospheric Sciences through the University of Alberta, and that's usually four to five years. Any other questions? I think I'm going to pass on the mic. I think I've used up my time now. Thank you guys so much. Thanks, Tiffany. That was great. Uh, do I need to do anything to the slides? They'll just magically become the right ones. <laughs> Actually, well, here, I'll trade you places right now. Well, uh, Ryan's fixing the slides for us. Uh, somebody had asked about signs of climate change in Saskatchewan, and like Tiffany <coughs> said, any given day's weather or any weather event, you can't say, oh, that's climate change. It's the uh, climate is the is the pattern of weather over time. And so the kind of weather things that we can expect to see and have been seeing are more floods and more droughts, for example. Floods tend to make the news more because there's crazy pictures of houses that have water up the sides of the house or cars deep in the water. So we've seen that on, on the news quite a bit in the last few years, different places in Saskatchewan that have had floods. And so, uh, so floods and drought are two of the big things that we're going to expect to see more and more and more over the next years and decades in Saskatchewan. So thanks again, Tiffany. That was fabulous. Um, and um, Tiffany mentioned quite a bit about CO2. She kept saying CO2 in the atmosphere is, is what's causing climate change and global warming. And this whole 25 Acts program is all about the things that you and I can do to reduce CO2 emissions. And, um, and so this, the whole CO2 thing is why you and I need to take actions to uh, help re uh, reduce climate change. So my name is Angie, and I work for the Saskatchewan Environmental Society. Pam's really shy, and she won't come up to the microphone. <laughs> Actually, Pam's not at all shy, but she's not coming up to the microphone today. <laughs> we, could, we could maybe, after the webcast is over, we could have her come up and do a little tap dance or something. <laughs> all right, so welcome to the 25 Acts of Energy Conservation Slideshow. The Science Centre and the Saskatchewan Environmental Society are working together to present this campaign. A campaign where you guys take action to conserve energy, conserve water or reduce waste, and maybe you can win money or prizes uh, for your school. Not for yourself. You don't get the money for yourself. It's for your school. But that's a pretty good deal, right? So what we hope that you're going to enter your class or school conservation project for a chance to win and do good things for the environment while you're at it. For this slideshow, we asked a whole bunch of people to tell us things they do to conserve. And these are the acts that they came up with. Act 1, turn out unnecessary lights. The Environmental Society, where Pam and I work, uh, our offices have lots of natural light, so we often don't need to turn on any extra lights. Fairhaven School did a campaign last year about turning off unnecessary lights, and they reduced their lighting energy use by 40%, just by turning out the lights that didn't need to be on. This is our executive director, Allison, blinded by all that natural light. <laughs> Look how the rooms have been designed, with windows between the offices to help let the natural light travel between spaces. Act 2 is Sask Energy's Gus the Gasosaurus. 
For every one degree Celsius that you turn down your thermostat, you can save 2% on your heating bill. Also, lowering your temperature, uh, your thermostat by 4 or 5 degrees overnight while you're sleeping or while nobody's home can save energy, money, and greenhouse gas emissions. Applying shrink film to your windows is a great way to reduce drafts and keep the warmth in. Sealing your windows is just one effective way of lowering your energy consumption. Gus is trying hard not to put his finger through the plastic. This draft dodger helps seal off drafts by blocking the space at the bottom of the door. A draft-free a draft -free home uh, prevents heat loss and saves energy. Switch to cold water for doing your laundry. 85 to 90 percent of the energy that we use to wash clothes is used to heat the water. So by turning the dial to cold on your washing machine, you help the environment, save money, and uh, save energy. These are City of Saskatoon employees, Shannon and Rebecca, showing off the energy efficient smart car that they drive around town when, they, when it's too far to walk or bus to meetings. But Saskatoon City Councillor Charlie Clark likes to ride his bike all year and drops his daughter off at preschool on his way to work. Act 8 is City, Saskatoon City Councillor Marin Lowen, and she's, that's right, she's checking the city's Christmas lights to make sure that they're using energy-saving LEDs. Oh, she's so dedicated. <laughs> the students from Ethel Millican School were one of last year's big winners, with a project that included 25 acts of conservation. In this act, they committed to using refillable water bottles favorite foods in reusable containers and reduce a bunch of waste. Hugh Cairns v. Students from Hugh Cairns VC School have another way of reducing lunch waste. Here they are cheerfully emptying the buckets of food waste into their compost bins. Banana peel anyone? Worms are becoming popular class pets. They're quiet, they keep to themselves, they eat your apple core. Act 11 shows students from Churchill High School harvesting the compost so they can grow more vegetables to share with their wormy friends. These LaRange students, also from Churchill High School, are setting out a fishing net. Their act of energy conservation is to eat local, sustainable food they catch and prepare themselves. Eating food that you catch or grow yourself is a great way to save energy. The food we eat often travels thousands of kilometers to a store near us. These students are using grow lights to grow a whole bunch of vegetables for snacks and lunches. Mmm, spinach. Act 14 is the U of S dining hall staff with vegetables grown at the university's horticulture club garden. Green is also the color on this green roof on top of the University of Saskatchewan's College of Law. Green roofs help absorb heat in the summer and keep buildings cool, as well as helping regulate rainwater runoff. Hey, that's my neighbor, Rahul. He's a kidney doctor, and even on a busy day, he has time to sip his coffee while he's charging up his electric car. And Act 17, take a bus. Ryan, standing right over there, <laughs> works here at the Science Center, and he takes to the bus takes the bus to work most days. It's a great way to reduce vehicle emissions. Nice selfie, Ryan. <laughs> Panels like these are generating electricity and reducing emissions created by burning fossil fuels for power. And Sheila is doing something simple but important. She's turning stuff off. The hot air balloon in the exhibits here uses, a pro uses propane fuel, a lot of it. Every night, Sheila turns it off so that the fuel isn't being wasted when no one's here to see the balloon. The cooperators have sponsored two of the cool prizes for 25 Acts. Two lucky schools will get a science exper experience, either here or at their school, and it's not picking up garbage. That's not the cool exper experience. What these cooperators' employees are doing in this photo, oh, is picking up garbage. <laughs> cooperators' employees are around Saskatchewan pick up garbage once a year to make their communities better places to live. Act 21 is brought to us by Bruno School. Hi Bruno. 
They regularly look after making sure that recycling gets where it's supposed to go. Westmount's teacher librarian, Leslie Book Baski, is loading up these girls with their weekend reading assignment. <laughs> Borrowing what we need instead of buying it is a great way to save us money and reduce waste and consumption. Here's another way to do great things. Habitat for Humanity takes donations of building materials and sells them to make money uh, to build homes for people that need a home. So don't throw it away. Take it to Jessica. Having just dealt with a big load of materials, she's sitting there waiting for you. <laughs> Gus from Sarcan, not to be confused with Gus the Gasosaurus, <laughs> keeps the beverage containers flowing up this incline conveyor on their way to get bailed. Over 400 million containers come through the two processing centers in Saskatoon and Regina each year. Sarcan uses these big cages to transport bigger beverage container refund orders from bottle drives, restaurants, schools, etc. Or maybe even to transport a Sarcan staff person or two, like Bernie here. Make sure you recycle your containers, make some money for your school, and reduce what's going to our landfills. At Global Studio here in Regina, the producer uses this panel to turn off all the studio lights after the show. Whitney Stinson makes sure to turn off her monitor and shut down her computer. And after a long day at work, Tiffany leaves the light, turns the lights off and leaves the newsroom. And that is Act 25, turn things off when you don't need them. So finally, here's Ethel, Ethel Milliken School again with some encouragement to do one act of energy conservation or 25 acts. Every act counts. So go to 25acts.ca, register your project, take action, and tell us about it. So does anybody have any questions about this kind of energy conservation stuff? Yes, sir. Anybody else? Any more questions? Yeah? I do have a question. I was wondering, do you also do uh, any consulting with larger like, companies and stuff? The reason why I asked that question is because on, I was just talking to my wife, I said, there's 135 shovel launches by NASA, NASA burning about 770,000 liters of fuel per single launch in exploration or in you know, the hydrogen exploration. G equals about 103, 104 million liters of fuel burnt through our atmosphere. Sometimes, you know, it, it's, it, we can reduce, but what about what about the real large and that's just with NASA, that's not including the whole of the world or air travel, etc. That, that's a huge amount of carbon. You know what, that's a really good question, and I'm glad you asked it. Sometimes we look at some of these really big sources of greenhouse gas emissions and we think well, we should just fix that one, or we should fix that one as well as all the other things. And there are individual specific actions that are really big, but lots of times people say to me, what's the one thing we could do to reduce energy? And I look a lot at all of the places that we consume energy, all of the ways that we emit greenhouse gas emissions, and you might say, well, it's industry. Industry does it. But then if you start looking at industry, which action is it within industry, and why does industry exist? Well, they exist to make stuff for us. And I wish there was sort of one thing that we could do, but what we need to do is one thing, and then another thing, and then another thing. And certainly, the big things like that do need to be addressed as well, uh, but all of the individual things that you and I can do are really important also. More questions? No? Oh. Could we maybe revisit the fish question? The oh, the fish question. Before? So the question was, um, so Tiffany had said that Saskatchewan lakes are starting to show increased levels of CO2 in the water. And the question was, is it then okay to eat the fish? Now, I've got to tell you, I'm an engineer, I'm not a biologist, but what I think is probably going on is, when the CO2 starts to go into the water and gets mixed in the water, it makes everything in the lake more acidic. And probably what happens is that all the things that the fish want to eat just aren't there as much, or maybe uh, 
the water isn't as nice for them to swim in. Just like if we were walking in pollution, maybe the fish would feel that they're swimming in, in slightly more acidic water that might not feel as good. I don't think the CO2 is a poison that would make their meat dangerous to us. That's my guess. Um, but I, th I think that it's harder for them to live in that water, but probably doesn't make them poisonous to eat. All right? Okay, well, the next thing I want to do is invite our sponsors to come up and say just a couple words. So first, we're going to invite Sydney from Sarkhan to come up and say a couple things to you. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for having uh, me today on behalf of everyone from Sarkhan. Thank you to Angie and Pam and everyone at the Science Centre for putting this together. And uh, thanks to everyone who's joining us from all over the province and those of you who are here today. So, um, does anyone here go to Sarkhan Recycling? <laughs> wow, that's fantastic. And what's your favourite part about going? Money. Money, <laughs> that's right. Is that what you're going to say? Yeah. Yeah. The money, yeah. So, um, just remember that when you are recycling, um, there's different places to put all kinds of things, but when you have beverage containers, make sure to separate them from the rest of your recycling and bring them to Sarkhan so you can get that money. And uh, this spring, we're going to be launching uh, some new education resources and uh, video and things like that to show our processing plant, which is where you saw old Gus there standing beside the incline conveyor. Does anyone have any other questions about Sarkhan? Good. Well, thank you very much uh, to everyone for putting this together and to you guys for being here today. Thanks, Sydney. And now we have Suzanne from the Cooperators. Hello, everyone, and welcome. I'm so pleased to be here on behalf of the Cooperators today. As we've heard, weather and climate change is so important to all of us. If you or your families experience weather-related disasters that damage your homes or your vehicles, the Cooperatives provides insurance that helps to repair those damages. A few years ago, we've heard about the floods and our neighbors in southern Alberta experienced major floods a few years ago. The Saddle Dome, home to the Calgary Flames. How many of you like hockey? Oh, quite a few. My son used to play hockey as well, so I'm very familiar with that. The Saddle Dome was underwater, as were many of the communities in and around Calgary and southern Alberta. It's estimated that the costs from that damage was almost $2 billion. That's a lot of money from one disaster. We've also heard about other disasters, such as tornadoes that Tiffany talked about, snowstorms, thunderstorms, forest fires. Those things affect all of us, families just like yours and mine. That's why it's so important for all of us to get involved in these types of activities that try to control climate change and weather-related disasters. Initiatives like conserving energy, conserving water, and reducing waste. Good luck to all of the schools involved in your projects this year. We're looking forward to receiving all of your submissions, and best wishes to all. Sask Energy. Um, Leslie was one of the people who actually came up with the idea for this contest, 25 Acts of Energy Conservation. So Leslie, would you come and join us? Thank you, Angie. It is really a pleasure to be here. I'm a former teacher. Even though I don't teach anymore, it's really fun when I get to come and spend time with classes and, and visit the schools. So this is a real treat today. Uh, I'd also like to really acknowledge all of those schools out there in webcast land for joining us today. It's really important that schools all over the province participate in this. 
Now, before I go, uh, I just want to tell you that it, it does matter what one person can do. And it does matter very, very much what students and youth can teach adults and change their behavior. You can do that. And I'm going to give you a couple of examples of how that's possible. A few years ago, I was really lucky and had a chance to attend a special conference that was organized by the United Nations, and it was specifically for children on the environment. There were children your age, about 400 of them, that represented 80 countries around the world, and they all came to Victoria in Canada, in BC, with their best ideas about how they were changing behavior and changing the environment in their countries. And they shared those with one another, and actually the students themselves selected the best ones, and those students went to the United Nations Conference for Adults on the Environment and talked about their ideas. So I'll give you an example of one of the ideas that I thought was really good that other schools have picked up across Canada and, and in other places in the world. How many of you have had your parents come and pick you up in front of the school? And how many of them in the wintertime leave their car running to keep it warm while they're waiting for you? Okay. So that's a really common thing to do, especially here in Canada when the weather is cold. But by the time they get to the school, their car is warm. And they really don't shut off their car just because it's a habit to just leave it running. It doesn't need to stay running for that time that they're sitting and waiting for you to come to the car. So you could hurry up and maybe go to the car faster. But what these students did in, no, I think it was in New Brunswick, uh, what they did was they actually um, did a campaign in their community and they went out to all the parents waiting in front of the school with a flyer that they had developed that talked about what the effect of all of the emissions coming from their cars was going to do to the atmosphere in their community if they didn't shut off their cars. And within six weeks they had eliminated car idling in front of their school. And that was young people teaching adults and changing their behavior. So I'm challenging all of you, and all of you out in the communities around Saskatchewan, to think about the acts of conservation that you can explore and promote in your school, in your community, in your family, and make changes that collectively will make a difference. So on behalf of Sask Energy, I'm very proud to be here and and to encourage you all to do that. We're happy to be a sponsor because we really, really believe that you can make a difference. And I'm excited to see what you send in as far as what your results are. It was really fun to see last year what the students could do and how creative they could be. So good luck, okay? Thank you. so much Leslie and thanks to all of you guys for actually being here at the Science Center today and thanks to all of you guys for being here not at the Science Center today and so just one more time check out 25acts.ca and uh, take some kind of an action and tell us about it and then I think that's do you have anything you want to okay so then I'd say we're done today but just wait here I know you guys want to have time to go on the exhibit floor but just wait for your teacher to tell you um, when you guys can go before you all run into the room and where to meet at the end okay, okay.